Hello and welcome to another episode of the Film Nerd Podcast. I'm Vince, this is episode 7, and I'm joined by another very special guest for this episode. My guest tonight is Elliot Powell. Elliot is originally from Washington, D.C. He's lived in Wisconsin. He's also lived in Spain, which is where we met in Sevilla in spring of 2016, which we will talk about in a little bit here. Elliot's a 2018 grad of Chapman University, which is located just outside of L.A., where he studied film production and philosophy. Elliot is a current resident of Los a- resident, excuse me, of Los Angeles, and he <laughs> works as a freelance digital intermediate colorist. And uh, he has work uh, in various fields in, in filmmaking between music videos, short films, student films, and a recent uh, Nicolas Cage movie. Um, if you check out, I'll link his IMDb page in the description of the YouTube video, but um, he's worked on a variety of things. In music videos, I, I didn't realize, Elliot, that you had worked on a clipping music video. I love, <laughs> love, love clipping. I was going through your your work on IMDb, and I saw that you had uh, – and I, I follow you on Instagram, so I had forgot you had posted because you usually post stills on Instagram of, of your work. But when I, I went back and saw that you posted a still from a clipping music video, oh, man, he worked on a clipping music video. So I just really got into them this last year. I love their stuff. But anyway, nice. Elliot Powell, how you doing, man? I'm pretty solid. How are you? <laughs> oh, you know, not too bad. Elliot and I were just chatting about a variety of things before I started recording here. But um, if you want to give kind of just a general outline, how, how have things been in L.A. for you over the last year? Especially um, working in, in the industry that you work in. How have things kind of been overall? Um, I mean, uh, me being in post-production, not too bad for sure. Um, especially being, say your, I mean, your job inherently kind of um, maybe not hand in hand, but goes well with having to work online and from home. I, yeah, I, would, I mean, I would assume, but. For sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I was, I was um, already working from like, just like my home suite before the pandemic. So my life didn't really change too much when it first happened. Work died down after like a couple of weeks for a bit because, you know, shooting stopped. Um, oh, yeah. Obviously, if there's not so, material to, to work yeah, on. Yeah. So, so yeah. So because shooting stopped, then it's only coloring things that like, you know, had already been shot like a while ago. Um, so for, yeah, a while it died down. Um, then I got this random month long job um in uh in uh northern california in-house um and then after that i was like not too busy for a while but then since like definitely since i don't know october uh yeah i've just been like crazy busy just like normal things have picked Um, back up again now that you know shoots have resumed for various projects and oh yeah I, i i yeah, I could work seven days a week easily if I wanted to. Oh, wow, to. nice. Did you have stretches <laughs> yeah. where you didn't have, like, for a week, you didn't have work at all? Or did you always at least have something, at least one oh, yeah. project I, to work on, at least? Uh, uh, yeah, no, there are definitely weeks, for sure, at the at the start where I didn't have, um, uh, yeah, too much work. Because, yeah, the, the production companies usually work with stop shooting. Um, and there's, so, yeah, it would just be, like, a, a couple, like, you know, project that some like a passion project somebody shot like a couple weeks ago or there was like a couple features i talked to about people um that you know had always been shot a while ago because it's like a bigger project um but yeah there are definitely like some periods where there was just like um yeah not nothing going on which also isn't you know abnormal freelancing regardless. And, and i usually bugged you when i or at least whenever we do get a chance to talk I always bug you to catch up on some movies <laughs> yeah i should have done that i because like in general i don't i don't watch as many movies as i'd like to because like you well, know, we'll get we'll I... save that because we're actually i do want to talk about that a little bit later so okay we'll, okay we'll save Sounds that good. we'll save that for a little bit later <laughs> um so, but overall, it sounds like things have, have been pretty well. You've at least maintained some somewhat steady work and things have picked up again recently. So that's Yeah, that's no, good as of the hear. past like six months, things yeah. have been, yeah, very busy for sure. And so yeah, I, I just keep getting busier. <laughs> well, and I am going to dive into, you. obviously you've seen the questions, but I have a few questions I'm going to dive into with Elliot here about his job specifically. Um, but before we get into that, I just kind of want to talk about for a second, um, you know, a little bit somber uh, sadder subject somewhat, um, Mm -hmm. you know, there's positives to it, but how we met and, uh, a professor that Elliot and I had in Spain. So Elliot and I had the pleasure of meeting, 
um, when we did our study abroad together in Sevilla um, from, you know, February 1st, I think, to, you know, early May in 2016. Um, we were at the same study abroad program, and we really got to know each other because we took two of the same classes together. Elliot, obviously, studying uh, film production in, in Chapman University, took um, it was called, what was the title of the class, Spanish Filmmaking or Filmmaking in Spain? Something like that. It was like Spanish I, Filmmaking, yeah. I thought was the official title of the class. And then the other one was um, Digital Storytelling. I was wasn't like in a, that one. You weren't in that one with me? No. Okay, so we just had the film the film studies, yeah, yeah. filmmaking class. Um, and so our, our professor, his name was, D, his real name was Jamie Scott Ross. Uh, but he went by Diego um, because he did not like how Spaniards... He didn't like Jaime. Yeah. And Jaime he didn't like the way his name was pronounced in Spanish because uh, Diego, I, you know, I, I was used to... We were used to calling him Diego because that's what he went by. Uh, yeah. Diego was dual citizenship. His family was... Half his family was from Oregon. Half his family was from Spain. So he was fluent in English and Spanish. He had dual citizenship. Um, so he's a very interesting guy, and he taught film classes and English classes at the University of Sevilla on top of working in the Spanish Studies Abroad program. But um, Elliot and I got really close and got to know each other really well because Diego um, extended us a very interesting opportunity. Elliot and I would kind of <laughs> – Elliot and I early on in the semester started chatting about movies and kind of got to know each other a little bit through some other people and hanging out. And um, he fo- – Elliot found out that I really love movies. I found out that Elliot was studying – you know, film production. So we got to chatting about various movies and movie topics. And obviously Diego being the professor of the class, we would just get into rabbit holes and tangents and side conversations with him about anything and everything movie related. And I don't even remember when he first extended the offer. It was pretty Yeah, early. I was trying to remember. <laughs> so our professor Diego extended the offer of going to take us out to get drinks after class. Um, which if you're an American, that just sounds insane. You know, <laughs> yeah, it was um, the coolest thing ever. <laughs> yeah. That you're, you're like, I couldn't imagine, you know, I, you know, I live in Michigan. So like Michigan state university, for example, like I couldn't imagine you get out of a class at Michigan state and a professor goes, Hey, let's go to the bar and get some drinks and talk about movies. <laughs> um, you know, and, and for, you know, in Spain and Europe, it's just a different culture and a different, it's, it's not, you know, it's very sociable. It's just part of the culture. Go out and you have a few drinks and, have good yeah. conversation and uh um I remember so he, Diego... he... sorry go ahead remember, he, remember he, he specifically took us to like like old traditional spanish bars too yep. um yep uh yeah canasta. Remember... it was uh <laughs> yeah. it was like canasta bars that so was like the yeah, strong yeah. wine this like really really strong traditional yeah, the, spanish the, wine the sherry it's so it was so good too and he would always take us to a different one i think we did it like five or six times Colin, yeah, it was Colin like came every a couple Thursday times. almost I know we made at one point late in the semester it became a routine and we yeah t- we t- <laughs> t- t- take turns who would pay the bill yeah, do you remember right. how they did the bill <laughs> do you remember how they did the bill yeah they'd write on the counter <laughs> yeah they'd like write yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. in chalk or like in some sort of a reasonable counter. thing yeah, on the counter yeah your yeah, drinks yeah. and how much you owed. Um, and then we would alternate who paid each time, but mm-hmm. I still have. So every time uh, Elliot and I went with Diego to these Canasta bars, these traditional Spanish bars, um, we talk movies for like one to two hours. It was, um, yeah, it was in three hours sometimes. sometimes sure. I mean, I remember one time leaving and I was like, I am drunk. <laughs> we were, <laughs> yeah, we, we were, yeah, because so Canasta, <laughs> I have the glass. Do you still have the glass? Yeah, yeah, it's us? right there. Yeah, it's up right up my stairs. So Diego, before we left, Diego gifted Elliot and I Canasta glasses. And uh, they're really small. They're like, they're make maybe the, twice the size of a shot glass. So it looks like a mini wine yeah, glass. About- but it probably holds about as much as liquid as like two shots because yeah, the yeah, canasta yeah. was like, I mean, it, it was, it tasted strong, but I think it was like close to like double of what maybe a normal glass of wine. I mean, it was like liquor in terms of the alcohol content. Yeah, it was pretty strong for <laughs> sure. <laughs> and so we would sit there, just talk movies and have like three of those or four. I remember one yeah. time having three or four and I'm like, yeah, and then that was I haven't, you know, like, I haven't eaten in a while. We'd have to get like some tapas. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a great time, man. I'll, I'll never forget it. And, and Diego, yeah, it was amazing. Diego would always give us film recommendations. I think I still have a list. He, I definitely still have a list somewhere. I had a, I remember I had a notepad and I like furiously wrote down all these films he recommended. I sh- I need to go and find it because I know I didn't get rid of it. I have it 
excuse me in a, in a box somewhere but mm -hmm. yeah it was uh it was very memorable and and unfortunately like, the reason i said this was kind of a somber conversation is because uh diego at the age of 50 i believe i think he had just turned 50 because i thought he had like a december birthday he had like a late in the year birthday um mm -hmm. passed away like a couple years before new year's um like december 2017 mm -hmm. um and Elliot actually went and was. Uh, did you were you in Sevilla for two weeks in summer of 2017? Yeah. So yeah, I was in Sevilla for like two, two and a half weeks um, before and I went. Stayed, and, and you stayed with Diego. Half the time bit, I was with Diego. Yeah. Bit, yeah. Yeah. Half the time I was just yeah in his apartment. You know. Yeah. It was Which great. Is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Diego. Even... Diego. Well, I was gonna say you guys Facetime me the week Elliot yeah. and I were talking about this before I started recording, but like the week before I got married. Uh, was like when Elliot first got there and he FaceTimed me because I hadn't seen it would had been a year since we were in Spain at that time. And and uh, so I talked with you guys uh, as you guys were in his apartment hanging out when you first got there. Yeah. In yeah. the <laughs> unbelievable heat of June or whenever oh my, it was. That like was early June. This, his apartment didn't have air conditioning either. Most of and those I, places didn't. Yeah. Yeah, I remember just like lying on my bed, lying on his bed shirtless, just like watching movies on my laptop, waiting until nighttime when it was cold. <laughs> I know because people, yeah, and people, so Carol and Caroline and I went back to Spain um, in June, July of 2019. Oh, so when we went, it was very hot. And it, it yeah, really yeah. is during like the hottest part of the day from like, like one to six, no one's outside. Like no. right after lunchtime, like, right up until like a few hours before dinner it's empty like the yeah. streets are empty because Completely, it's so yeah. hot yeah i mean so it'll still be do... like 80 degrees at night oh yeah people would do yeah. things in the morning <laughs> and late at night that's it they wouldn't go outside during the day it was too hot mm -hmm. but but yeah i, I wanted to meant i thought that story would be fun to talk about because it's uh, it's uh one of my favorite experiences of in spain was yeah Ellie, Ellie and diego and i talking about movies over canasta you know to... yeah without a doubt that was so well special. you're <laughs> You're a few years younger than me. You were you 19 at the time? I was 19. Yes, or 20? I was 19. I was, I was 19. 23. I was a fifth year senior. Or, Everyone always made fun of me. No, I was I was man. 20. I was 20. Yeah. Okay. So I I just think thinking back to you know you 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 and I 20 and 23 year old hanging out with this <laughs> professor who's in his late 40s <laughs> drinking at the bars and in, in Spain yeah. and Sevilla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, uh, pe people, if you're an American, it sounds strange, but it's just a cultural thing. And he was American, you know, he was dual citizenship American. Spanish, yeah, yeah. But, you know, and we t we talked about the the oddity of that situation from an American standpoint, but was, for sure, yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, rest rest in peace to Professor Diego. He was a great yeah, guy. For sure. I miss him dearly, and it's very sad that uh, um, you know, unfortunate, untimely passing, but man was he yeah. a great, great dude was loved by everyone i didn't know anyone that i met over there that interacted with him that uh, had a bad thing to say about him no not at all yeah you couldn't <laughs> absolutely yeah um so we'll move on here i'm gonna talk with elliot about a few uh personal things with him some questions about him in terms of uh what he does uh so the first <laughs> thing i wanted to ask is if you would mind kind of given maybe um a summary of your journey um from you know in terms of from the time you decided uh, you know, to go to film school to, to kind of work through, um, get to your, you know, whether you consider it like a big breakthrough, but, you know, getting to work on a <laughs> kind of a somewhat, uh, small budget, medium budget, you know, action sci-fi small budget. <laughs> yeah. Jiu-jitsu with Nicolas Cage, but still, man, it's a big deal. That's pretty cool. So uh, no, yeah, it's cool. Want to sure. kind of just talk, you know, a little general, the, the kind of journey, that path that, that got you Sure. There. Sure. I mean, yeah, I've been making like videos and um yeah i mean i started making like videos and films when i was 11 12 maybe mm -hmm. uh making skateboarding videos I, yeah i remember you telling me about that um yeah because i remember my brother started doing it first and then i kind of like took over and then got better at it uh -huh. than him because <laughs> um, you really got into the technical stuff yeah something like that um <laughs> and then um and then, uh, yeah, I remember like my brother played lacrosse and I remember uh, I was, I was somehow like in the car with, um, him and his lacrosse coach for some reason. And then he like offered me 50 bucks to pay, um, to, to film the rest of the lacrosse season. I was like, oh, Hey, I can make money off this. <laughs> um, so that's kind of like basically when I knew I wanted to, 
to work in film. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I kept like, you know, making films and stuff throughout high school, um, you know, films and very, various videos, took a two year IP film class. Um, oh, you did take a it, film class in high school too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took a two year IB film class in nice. um, junior, senior year of high school. I uh, also went to Sundance both those years, which was awesome. Oh, um, that's a <laughs> that's a bucket list goal of mine to go to Sundance Film Festival. Yeah, it was it was great. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, ended up going to Chapman University. Um, Do you want to talk Jersey about Rachel. why or or how you? kind of happened upon Chapman, why you decided there, how you got hooked up with it. Cause I did, uh, I, I looked into it a little bit and it's, it's a pretty highly regarded prestigious film school. So I, I mean, just curious how you, how you decide on that one or what brought you to Chapman. Yeah, Especially because you're from DC and obviously you got to go to California. Now you don't have, you I, don't have to, but it's kind of, I thought I was going to go to school in New York. Like before I okay. started applying, That's, I actually yeah, thought I was going to go to school in New York. Too. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I basically just like went went down the list of um, of top film schools. I applied to USC, which I I made it into the film program, but I, my grades apparently were good enough to get into the um, oh wow the uh, the regular program. Um, and you have to be accepted into both. Yeah, yeah. Like I had an interview, and like the interview the interviewer guy was like, "Oh yeah," and if it was up to me, uh, then you'd get in. But then oh, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, that was like an interview specifically for the film program. Yep. Um, and um, and then I don't want to go to UCLA because they you, you actually didn't start studying film really or shooting anything until your junior year. Um, and then NYU is too expensive. And then uh, yeah, the undergrad one after that was was Chapman. Um, and then um, the few other schools I applied to as well. But yeah, Chapman was was the um, one I got into. I'm super grateful for because honestly, I think it deserves the number one spot <laughs> on the list of top film schools. Um, and um, yeah, I went there. And then um, so the funny thing was that like, so yeah, growing up, like I did all this, you know, different kinds of filmmaking. And I kind of had this like naive idea that to be a filmmaker, you just had to know how to do everything. So like, you know, I learned how to direct, learned how to shoot, I learned how to edit, learned mm -hmm. how to color. And then I got to Chapman and then I was like, oh, why is everybody calling me a cinematographer? Why is everybody calling me a colorist? Like, doesn't everybody know how to do this? Uh, but it turns out no, some people just needed like movies and they, so they decided to study film, but I didn't actually like know anything technical. Um, and then um, so few people knew how to like color grade that I ended up um, uh, they paying me for it. And then, um, so yeah, I kind of got an, into it more for that. And then I took, uh, my freshman year there was over interterm or like j term is called it some schools yep. like in between semesters yeah i know a lot of schools do that yeah um so there was this one uh color grading class taught by this guy tashi Triu, who's now both my friend and my mentor um who um he graduated from chapman in like 2008 um and um incredibly smart guy is like the kind of guy like you talk to him and he'll try to like dumb down what he says and mm -hmm. he's st still used 20 words you've never heard of before <laughs> <laughs> um but incredibly smart um he i think he started at technicolor um oh, wow. then uh ended up at e-film um and um now well now e-film got combined with company three if um if uh yeah if you know anybody looks into, you know, the different, you know, color houses that are in Los Angeles. Um, but yeah, he's, um, uh, yeah, super like technical, smart guy. He's, um, colored multiple, like big Hollywood movies and, you know, worked on tons more, uh, like he's worked on like countless number of the Marvel and Star Wars movies, for example. And you got, um, hooked, and you got hooked up with him through Chapman. You, you made a relationship through, through. Yeah. So he, so he taught the, um, the he we teach over over that inner term j term um oh okay. this one class gotcha um and uh it was like it was weird because it was like over it was i was also over the weekends it was like saturday sunday for like eight hours yeah a day. <laughs> those j terms are weird right the, yeah. the scheduling yeah because mo most of them were like you know there'd be like monday tuesday wednesday or something yeah. like that but his was over the weekend because he's working during the week okay that makes um, sense yeah. but um but yeah, it was great because um, yeah, I'd already like you know knew how to do it, I knew how to color grade, um, like I knew the software at least pretty well at that point. But he kind of taught me how to do everything properly, like on a technical level, which is like 
uh, it kind of seems like when I, when, you know, I tell people that I'm a colorist, um, and like explain like what my job is, um, then it kind of seems that I'm just kind of like, you know, messing around with like these like color wheels and like making it just like, you know, messing with the software, making it so, look pretty, but it's actually, well, that, that's, that was my next question is what, what is a, for people who don't know, what is a colorist? What, what do you, so what yeah, do you, basically the, do? the way I usually explain it is that it's, um, it's kind of like Photoshop, but for video. So after a, you know, a film, commercial, music video, um, whatever is edited, then I take the, the hopefully picture locked cut, um, sometimes not, and then it causes a headache, but usually after the <laughs> editing is done. <laughs> um, I was going to say the if cut. the edit, so you do get projects where it's like, it hasn't got, had a first pass yet in the editing room. Oh, no, no, no. It's, yeah, it's usually, it's, it's usually like pretty final, but okay. like, um, uh, it's just, but if, if they do update anything then I either need to like, then they need to like send me the new cut and then I have oh, to like update have... it and then okay. recopy everything from the old so project. So you, new you project. like getting a project and knowing, Hey, this is probably not going to need to come back to me again. Yeah, I, ideally... they've done everything else. Everything else is Exactly. Finished. Ideally okay. it's picture locked. None of the cuts change. Yep. Maybe they need to change the titles or anything, but I'm not touching any of that. Um, yeah. If otherwise it just ends up being more time than is necessary on mm -hmm. my end. Uh, uh, but yeah, so basically I take, so after a, you know, a film, commercial, video, whatever's edited, um, then I take every shot. My job is basically to make everything look prettier. So, you know, I'll change the contrast around, change the brightness. If there are like, you know, mistakes in the lighting, like they didn't like the subject enough, I can brighten up the subject's face. Um, uh, do minor beauty work as well. Um, so like if I need to like minor skin smoothing, I can do that. Anything past that, then I'll send it to somebody else. Um, and um and so there's that, and then there's kind of like the like Instagram filters aspect of it, um, where you're kind of just for, playing around with colors. In layman's terms. <laughs> in layman's terms. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's much more complicated than that. Yeah, so I was going to say, you're, uh, you're definitely simplifying it because I know it's far more complicated. I mean, yeah, I'm not just here. like choosing a filter. And no, I, it oh, no, I'm like I, doing that's certain why, things. To like, that's why I just wanted to say that for anyone listening. No. Like he's, but he's yeah, uh, I'm, <laughs> very simply, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing, I'm like playing around with the colors to give give the image a certain feel, same as like Instagram filters would do when you swipe through, except I'm doing it just but, like a bit but yeah, significantly more in depth. Yeah, the Instagram filters are just default, you know, general filters, whereas you're like creating them in a sense. Exactly. You are yeah, doing I'm creating. I'm creating them. I'm basing them off of like certain film emulations, stuff like that, or, you know, get someone to give me a specific reference. So I want it to look like this, or I want it to feel like this. And so then I have to interpret that and then translate that into the images they actually shot um but uh but yeah when you explain it like that it kind of sounds like i'm just kind of just like you know playing around with these like you know i have they have like this this um if anybody sees like a colors they've always got these panels with like these three wheels on them that represent like the shadows mid tones and highlights yep. and there's all these other knobs I've, yeah and I, kinda... I watched you when we were in spain i remember watching you working on some some projects oh, yeah. it was interesting a few times when you were in when we were at your dorm room and you <laughs> i think you were working on a student project at that time you had I something. Remember. I remember you had something that you were working on because I watched you do it work on it a few times. Had the software pulled up, and huh. I remember it was fascinating, kind of watching you do it. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't even remember working on anything, but yeah, but yeah, but so it kind of looks like I'm just kind of like you know messing around, just like in the software. But it's actually like a very large technical element um, to coloring. Um, like it's about fifty fifty technical and technical and creative, um, and that you have to work with worry about like the different color spaces, like no, like uh for example know that like light in real life behaves linearly the camera records it logarithmically it's being displayed on your monitor exponentially so you have to like know how the image is like going through the pipeline and then know how the controls respond in different parts of the pipeline lots of things like that yeah it's not as just um, simple as going hey i'm gonna play around with these colors and this lighting and hey if it looks exactly. okay it looks okay there's actually some some metrics and parameters and some industry standards and things like that they exactly like you exactly. said you got the creativity part of it and that's where the uniqueness of you and your talents comes in because people will want to hire you because you may do something a little bit different bring something exactly more yep. interesting to the table while at the same time adhering to some of those industry standards or parameters that you you can't just throw them out the window <laughs> precisely yeah. yeah i mean it's like once you get past that kind of like technical hump then it's like all these options up and up to you in terms of what you want to do creatively but uh that hump is like definitely very high and so that's why there aren't that many colors in general um because uh a it's also a job not many people even know exists like outside of the film world um 
But before um, before I before I met you, I kind of assumed that it was part of the editing process that it was just something the editor did. Before I met no. you, I wasn't aware that it was a completely separate field. So yeah, you yeah. have since I met you, <laughs> I, it is something that I've become far more aware of than I was <laughs> before that. Yeah, I, just I mean, that, that, the editor took care of all those things. I mean, yeah, that, that'll be true if, for you know for if anybody is like you know doing like their own like videography yeah, projects. Small but in terms of any, yeah. yeah, and anything with there's like a team of people is almost always going to be a a colorist. Um, but yeah, there aren't many of us like at all because of that. Um, and um, even among the people who like you know call themselves colorists or want to be colorists, aren't that many people know what they're doing. Which is why that class is so great. Which I took it that I took it freshman year, which had like it's special proof to get in, and then I also ended up like sitting on it every other year. That's then because of that, that the guy taught the class, Tashi Tree, um, ended up becoming like my friend and mentor. Um, I text him all the time, even now. Um, and um, uh, but yes, yeah, so that like very much got me over that like technical hump, and then from there I just kind of started coloring pretty much everybody's films at Chapman um mostly to make money um like that was pretty much how i funded my thesis film yeah was just coloring like a crazy number of movies um i was famous for not sleeping <laughs> um I, or I, rather I if i was if i was sleeping it was usually in the the color suites at at the film school <laughs> i remember in spain man you would stay up all night and you would sleep uh you slept at weird times <laughs> Well, that was a bit, that was a bit different. Spain, I was a very different person. Yeah, <laughs> that was that was uh yeah, staying up for not not work. <laughs> you didn't, yeah, you didn't care. Yeah, we're, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, I basically yeah, just like colored a crazy amount of stuff, which like um, some some of those projects even now um, is yeah, Chapman like more than anything produces like great like technical fields like cinematographers and production designers and you know colors. So, okay. um, Since you so some of those projects in... even now are are even in my um in my my reel on my website still just because they they look that great. Oh um, yeah, yeah. I mean that's but basically doing that, coloring all those films was kind of like what allowed me like build my portfolio. And then when I graduated, I could just move to just coloring freelance um, more or less easily. Um, which yeah, is what I ended up doing. <laughs> so before, because I do have a couple more questions with the with um with your job specifically, but going back sure. one step because you brought Chapman back up. Um, I did want to ask you, so what are your, kind of your thoughts in general on the film school experience? Um, you know, for anyone aspiring, you know, it, to, uh, to work in that field, that industry, uh -huh. you know, you have, you know, to use a very, a very extreme high profile example, you got someone like Quentin Tarantino who didn't yeah, go yeah. to film school and people see people like him, obviously he's on a big stage. He's a, you know, very well-known name, you know, who goes, I didn't go to film school. I went to movies. Um, but then someone like you, who is not, you know, an A-list celebrity, but you are making a living now having gone to film school and you've gotten a very technical job as a result of it and um, worked on a lot of great projects and made great connections. Um, what would you say to someone who is like, you know, debating, um, you know, going, trying to pick film school or just go to school and maybe figure it out later? Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, I mean, it's definitely got, you know, ups and downs for sure. Um, like, um, like it's definitely not necessarily necessary to go to film film school to become a filmmaker or work in, in any part of the film industry, really. Um, it's mostly helpful, um, like, especially in general, like I've, I, like at Chapman, I've talked to people who went to USC, I've talked to people who went to NYU. Most people say the same thing that you don't necessarily really learn that much in class. Um, you'll learn things, but the real way you learn how to, um, depending on what you're doing, like if you're, uh, you know, producing, then maybe a little bit less so if you're doing some technical, um, like, like obviously I learned a lot in that, that coloring class, for example, but like um, certainly like directing, writing, cinematography classes, those things, there are things you really more learn just by doing it over and over again. Um, and with directing and writing, also just like watching movies, but not so much something that can be taught that well in class. So, I mean, obviously you learn things, but most of what you learn is gonna come from just doing it. Which is also part of why I love Chapman is because Chapman is set up that um, they're basically films shooting every single weekend. They had all the resources um, for you. Yeah, they had all the resources, but not even just the resources, because like some some film programs, um, like UC, for example, it's set up so that only a limited number of people direct films. Okay. Um, whereas at Chapman, everybody wants to direct a film, directs a film. So that means that there's like 
hundred something films shooting yeah. every year. So that means literally every single weekend, like that's, that's basically how people at Chapman get so good is that, um, is that literally, literally every single weekend you can go on set and work on a film uh, or two. Um, and so then because of that, just like very, very quickly, you get good at it. Um, and then you start doing, you know, stuff outside of school and you start making money or, um, um, and so then, you know, most people are there like, um, not most people, I mean, a, a decent number of people for sure, um, if not most, um, at, at least people who are, you know, doing cinematography or want to, you know, be an assistant camera or um, anything technical like that. A large number of them end up, you know, you know working, doing what they want to do part time before they graduate. Um, and, um, and so in that sense, it's great if you can find a school that can give you a lot of hands on experience like that, but a lot of them don't. Um, the other main way is certainly just through the main benefit is networking. Yeah, a lot um, of connections, I'm sure. Yeah, like even now, like, um, you know, everybody well, I work with. talking about your mentor who you met there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, example, there's, yeah, there's him um, who, um, I mean, yeah, only once or twice has I ever, ever, actually ever gotten work from him. But like, the thing is, is that like, if, you, if you're going to film school, then, um, you know, the people that you're working with, you know, when you're a junior, are eventually going to graduate and they're going to work. And when you graduate, then they'll, then they might hire you. Um, yep. And like, even now, like when I graduated, almost everybody I worked with um, was where people I graduated with because everybody just moved from, from Orange County to LA, almost everybody. And so then you're just working. It was like film school 2.0, just like, you know, you're just working <laughs> with the same people over yep. and over again. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, um, it's gr- Yeah. Like you said, it's a great network though. It's, it's, I feel like it gives you a great support system. So then you don't. Yeah, with, without a doubt. You don't but, have a lot of excuses. Like, I feel like you'd have to try to not, if at least if you were a nice person, I'm, you know, you're a nice person. But if you had, you know, maybe classmates who weren't good at developing relationships with other students, you would assume the people that develop good relationships, you know, then they're going to go out of each other's way to help each other, maybe work on projects if, if they're competent, obviously. If Most they're, definitely. If they're yeah. incompetent, that's one thing, but. Yeah, and especially like, you know, right when you graduate too, you know, everybody's like, you know, trying to do these like, you know, these side projects, you know, build their portfolio and everything. And then like the only way that's going to happen is if you have, you know, if you know people who, yep. you know, they're your friends and they're also good at what they do. It's who you um, know, not what who you will know. Who can work on it, you know, for free or not very much, for much money, which is, yeah, something that's much more easier done if you're in film school than not. Um, so yeah, and that, in terms of that aspect, if you can go to, um, to a good film school, um and it's not going to be a problem for you financially then it's a great thing to do i would say um but definitely not necessary and also there's you know tons of other things like like in terms of like um my own personal filmmaking like i was probably influenced more so by the classes i took in college outside of the film school um than the ones inside so you you were in it's um the specific college was dodge Right. Yeah. So, so it's Chapman University, and then Dodge College of Film Media Arts is the film so, school. So, and then you did part. You were still taking cl- general education classes at Chapman. Well, so I was a, film school. Yeah. So I was. So I ended up becoming a philosophy double major. Okay. Um, and then I was also in the honors program, which is like a minor, basically. Um, and in those classes, those are like things where I learned things that like made me think, and like I was gonna, you know, you know, when you make a movie, you don't make a movie about filmmaking you make a movie about life so you have to learn about other things in order to make something that has actual content so and those classes like it just as like a person and um also as a um as you know for my own personal filmmaking just like you know had a huge effect on me for sure um and so in that sense yeah it was all great but (laughs) in hindsight knowing what i knew at the time when I decided to go to film school, it was a horrible idea financially. <laughs> like I had absolutely, I, I had, I should not have, I, I, yeah, I had no reason to think that I was gonna be able to uh, graduate and then easily make enough money to pay off all the student debt that I still currently have. Uh, Luckily, yep. it worked out. I didn't out go pretty to film well. school, but I still got, yeah, I got <laughs> debt too. <laughs> yep. Luckily for me, it worked out pretty well in that I'm doing this like, you know, super niche job um where i can make a steady decent income of, right yeah, yeah yeah where i can yeah make um, a decent amount of money um but um but in general i wouldn't say that the entire experience was worth the ridiculous price tag um you know barring like scholarships and you know having extremely wealthy families and things like that yeah um 
uh, yeah, I definitely wouldn't recommend uh, heavily taking out private loans or anything like that to go to film school. So you don't um, you don't regret the decision, but at the same time, I don't personally regret like it because if... I worked. Yeah. I don't personally regret it because it worked out for me like yeah. greatly, but it was a bad decision. Like knowing what I knew when I decided to go, going um, into it blind and not knowing what the result would be. Because like, yeah, I mean, I didn't even think about it. I was just like, oh, I got in the chat, man, I'm gonna go. Um, and my mom was like, oh yeah, we'll make it work. And then I my mom said graduated. And my mom was college. like, okay, now you gotta make it work. Yeah. And I was like, good Wait, luck. <laughs> yeah, literally. Here's your student <laughs> like, loans. Luckily, I made it happen. But uh, yeah, yeah, not the best idea in hindsight. And um, the other thing is that, like, yeah, while I still, you know, most people I work with or yeah, I mean, probably like not most people, but a lot of people work with, they're all people from Chapman, people who like, um, who I got connected to because of somebody I knew from Chapman. Um, you know, there's also like, like my roommate's a cinematographer and gaffer and the person he works with on literally every single job didn't go to film school. Um, I, uh, that month long job in Northern California, um, which actually I think I'm allowed to say who it was for. I was at, I was at, um, I was working for um, Apple that entire month. Oh, wow. um, and, um, are you, um to talk, are you allowed to talk about what the project was? I can't no? talk about that. Okay. Nah, not, okay. not even a little bit. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to uh, whatever it is. What do you kind of, <laughs> um, um, I mean, it was, it's already out. It wasn't like it is. It was, it's a, it was, yeah, it was like it like last June, um, that I was there. Um, but I, yeah, I got around to that because there was another colorist, um, uh Dante who knew my other friend Dylan who I graduated from Chapman with um and then we're good friends now um and um uh Dante also didn't go to film school he just started okay. started out as a production assistant um when he was 16 18 oh wow so he got in and then early yeah he got in got in pretty early but then um yeah just worked his way up he's like post production assistant then became post production mm -hmm. assistant then became a assistant engineer and then somehow winded up becoming a colorist now he's like a you know a big colorist who does you know work does like gucci campaigns and stuff like that all the wow. time um he was the first you know guy they they brought onto that month on project um he uh he colored chef's table um that that's tv incredible. series good for him um and um yeah he didn't go to film school either he just kind of um you know worked his way up so it's definitely not necessary if you put to work in for sure either yeah um yeah so if i would say if you if you can do it easily then sure but if not <laughs> then maybe don't, uh reconsider. don't worry about it being like the only way to break into the industry or get yeah involved definitely with, with definitely not or, yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah okay that that makes sense and i i i think that it, that's definitely good advice and i i think that carries over to most most um i would you know, think students so honestly, now yeah. because I tell, you know, I'm a teacher and I tell students all the time, don't worry about going to some big expensive state school, partying for two years, flunking out <laughs> of classes. Um, you know what I mean? You can go to the community college and still go to your parties and hang out with your friends at the state school, but you yeah, can, yeah. you're paying for the same education, but you can pay out of pocket instead of taking out thousands and thousands of loan dollars. Of yeah. Loan, they're, they're, so. I was always like, kind of jealous of the transfer students at Chapman who went to community college for like two years and then transferred yeah. in. I was like, oh, that's probably the move. <laughs> yeah, that's what my that's what my wife did. I mean, she didn't do film school, obviously, but she did two years of community college and then transferred to Michigan State. So she has uh -huh. no, she has no debt. She never took out a loan. No, oh, man. She paid for it all in pocket. <laughs> incredibly nice. <laughs> she she worked yeah, she worked all through high school and all through college. So she 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 went to community college first and had a scholarship and pay out of pocket i'm the one who brought all the debt to the <laughs> to the family <laughs> um but anyway so uh the next couple questions i wanted to ask you get a little bit more specific with with your job here um sure sure one of them i think you've kind of already answered but so you never really set out to be a colorist you originally you know were making your own projects filming your own projects editing you were doing a little bit of everything um and i know when i talked with you in spain five years ago that at one time you're goal was to be a director right um i mean yeah so like coloring was like i mean definitely when i was in wait i was in spain second semester no yeah second semester five, sophomore year. five years ago this month yeah oh man Isn't that wow crazy? that's crazy five years ago. wow <laughs> oh man um but um i mean yeah even then i definitely knew that like 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 because by that point i knew i was, I was pretty sure i was going to be a colorist when i graduated 
um, because I knew it'd be like a, the by far the safest way for me to just like become like financially stable and like you know especially with it being such a, such a, a niche a niche job exactly yeah you don't have as much um, competition or it's not as difficult to I mean, find work may, maybe maybe is some yeah and, and the other thing was is that like it was the other cool thing about going to film school is that i wasn't i wasn't worried about doing that at all because i'd seen people do that before me mm-hmm. like i'd see another i knew other people who were like um who either went to chapman like one person who went to chapman and one person um who didn't go to chapman who was like involved in like the community um who were like both like a year or two older than me than me who you know then moved to la and then started you know coloring freelance and did no problem and i was like oh i can do it they're doing no problem mm-hmm. um so i had that like you know that positive example so i wasn't even I, I always like knew that was basically that was gonna be like the by far the 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 surest thing i could do to just like yeah move to la and be able to like pay rent and you know my my debt and everything um <laughs> And um, so, yeah, so definitely by like start of sophomore year, end of, um, end of, um, uh, yeah, definitely, yeah, by start of sophomore year, probably before I, I, I was, I was in Spain with you, um, I knew that was what I was going to do when I graduated. Yep. Um, and, um, and yeah, I mean, I've still, you know, like almost everybody in LA, I would love to do like my own, you know, personal projects and stuff like that from time to time. Um, but yeah, for the past like you know two three years since I graduated, I've just been focused on like getting my uh, my my uh, you know colors my career as a colorist to some place where it's like you know good and stable, base, which it definitely building, is yeah, now. Some stability and things like that. Um, yeah, and then you know if I want to, if I feel like you know branch out and do you know more side projects or something like that. Um, and um, but yeah, so I didn't. I wouldn't say, I mean, I kind of like knew I wanted to be a colorist. Like I knew pretty on it was what I wanted to do. Um, uh, at least in college anyways, if you'd asked me in high school, I remember <laughs> when I first started filmmaking, I was like, oh, I never want to color in videos. I just wanted to be, be right in camera. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, pr- pr- pretty early on, I knew it was what I was going to do um, as a, as a career to, to make money for sure. Um, so then getting even more specific here, kind of going down a little bit of a rabbit hole with, with what you do. Uh, so what's kind of like working as a colorist, what's your kind of day to day or week to week? Like, I know, <laughs> I know you and I discussed it a little bit before I started. Recording, I mean, but it, it, it could be, I mean, yeah, it could be especially totally cause different. you're a free freelance. So you, you really yeah, have a so, lot of variety. I mean, yeah, I work on a different project every day for the most part. Um, yeah, like most projects, I charge a day rate, um, and usually that day rate is just one day. Um, and um, so it really depends on the project and the client, um, because um, yeah, some jobs will take you know the full like 10, 12 hour a day. A lot of jobs will only take like three or four hours. Um, a project might have a project for somebody on the East Coast, in which case I you know got to wake up a little bit earlier, start a little bit earlier. Um, or I might have a job where I can sleep until 12 and then work until six and then I'll be good. Um, so it really depends. Um, in general, I find myself working up, working more at night than in the day, just cause I'm a night owl. Um, and I just, yeah, I can I kind of have a flexibility in my schedule. Um, and then, but then also some clients where it's like, I know I have to like start at 9am every day. Um, so I can, um, you know, communicate because yeah, obviously now what I'm doing, everything is remote. Um, so, um, you know, I can communicate with the, uh, the directors and the producers and cinematographers saying, give me notes on what I'm doing. Um, but, um, yeah, generally for the most part, it's like, I'll wake up, I'll have a hard drive where somebody will have email me the files, I'll set up the project. Um, then usually I'll either, um, at that point, I'll either send stills to the uh, director of cinematographer. I'll or actually, first of all, I'll just, I'll set everything up and then I'll play around. It's like I'll, I'll, I've, I'll already have talked with them about you know what kind of kind of look they want it to um, to go for, and then I just kind of play around with um, with yeah with the color, and so I find something that fits like what they're going for that you know I think looks good. Then I'll send them stills of that. Um, they'll prove it or they'll give me notes on it. We'll mess around. Then once the general look is set, then I'll take that and then I'll apply it across the whole thing, um, the whole uh, yeah the whole piece and make it all consistent and match um, with that look that we, we just set with those stills. Um, also, oftentimes, um, either that last part um, where, where I, after I've passed it across, I'll either you know, send them um, 
a link on Frame.io um, or Vimeo for them to review. Um, or um, I'll do a, uh, a live session with them. So I'll stream my resolve feed for, um, you know, my, my project feed with, to them um, directly to review. Sometimes we'll also do that just for like the whole day. So like, you know, I'll wake up, I'll send them to the, the live stream, and then we'll just work from the start of the day until it's done. Um, before the pandemic, that's how I normally do things, except mm -hmm. they would be in the room with me. Yep. <laughs> um, um, they, 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 you know, they'd come with a hard drive, it's other project, and then we just color until the, until it was done. Um, so are, and, mo are uh, most of your projects then like that, where it's like you start and then you're going and you're working on it until it's done, or do you have some that might carry pretty across much. multiple days? Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> I try to make it like one day in and out, um, about 50% of the projects that actually happens, like there'll always be things where it's like, um, oh, can we just like touch up this like one thing okay. real quick? Um, or do you charge a day notes. rate at that point if they're coming back to you? It, it depends on the, the client and the project, oh, gotcha. um, and the rate. Um, cause sometimes I kind of like build it in, um, that, you know, if, if I think they might, you know, um be, be back. coming back yep yeah and also it depends on like how extensive they're asking for like if they just need me to you know color one more shot and now yeah, that's whatever oh, yeah um and then sometimes also it's like i i i want it to be more like spread out like if i have like a bunch of projects at one time sometimes it's easier um to just like you know do part of it this day and then part of it another day and part of it another day in which case it's not like if i like it'll be a like a, about a day's total worth of work at max, but it's going to be spread out over multiple days. So it really depends. My schedule is all over the place. Like I, I can never plan out when, like the other thing is like half the time, I won't know what jobs I'm doing. I'll know half of the week, like the week prior, but I won't uh -huh. know the other half of the week until the week of. So like, it's really hard to actually like plan out my weeks. Um, like people would tell me, oh, you're free Saturday. I'm like, oh, I don't know. Ask me Friday. <laughs> um, I know. That's, um, well, like, yeah, you and I, you joke. Yeah, even just setting like, trying song. to set up uh, doing a podcast. <laughs> you're like, I, I just, you're like, I don't know. I just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now I'm trying to be more certain about having actual weekends because I've definitely yeah. been overworked for sure. Yeah. Give yourself time um, for you. Yeah. Which exactly. I appreciate. I appreciate, man. Of course. Yeah. I mean, no, I really wanted to do this um but yeah definitely uh yeah finding a, a work-life balance in that sense is kind of hard uh, but for the most part it's like generally really flexible mm -hmm. i like that a lot of days i can choose like you're when kind i wake your up own, you're kind of your own boss on in that sense pretty much yeah well. yeah yeah i mean there's... your clients are you know telling you how yeah i mean i've got producers done, i got but... to listen to um, yeah yeah and then um yeah i'll occasionally have some products that'll be like multiple days um because like most stuff i do is like short form it'll be like you know commercials or usually commercials and music videos um, or, you know, sometimes like a branded documentary, which is like half documentary, half commercial. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, most of the time those things is like a one day thing. Sometimes like next week I'm doing a, a project for uh, Chevron that I've done okay. three days for already. Oh, wow. Um, and, um, and then I'm doing four days next week. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's pretty rare. Um, most of the time it's like one max like two or three days um apart from the two feature films that i've done which were longer than they should have been <laughs> so because because um, you brought that up do you want to we want to talk sure talk sure about, i unfortunately have not had a chance to watch jujitsu yet i was oh, actually really? doing everything that's okay i i wanted yeah. to watch it so bad this week and i didn't end up making time it, to do it apparently it will be out on netflix next month Oh, I was going to, I was going to run it on Amazon. It was like two ninety nine on Amazon or something. I mean, yeah, you could do that too, but it probably will also be on Netflix. It will month. be. Okay. I'm, so maybe I'll I'm, wait until it's on told. Netflix. I'm and told. Then, and, then, and then we can talk about it uh, the next <laughs> sure. time we have you on. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, but yeah, that was, um, yeah, just like another, like, you know, l like we we're saying before, it's kind of like who, you know, as much as what, you know, um, and yeah. Um, that was uh, so this guy, Dan McDonald, who went to Chapman, graduated, um, uh, I think, like four or five years before I did. Mm -hmm. um, but there's this Facebook group, Chapman Film Connection, where you just kind of, um, you you go there and you post if you just like need crew yep. uh, or connections or anything like that. And he posted they're looking for a colorist for this ad agency slash production company. And then I responded. Um, that job didn't end up happening, but we ended up having lunch. Um, and... Um, and got along pretty well. Um, and um, 
and then uh yeah i was like yeah, that was like when was that that was must have been summer 2018 i think it was okay yeah, pretty pretty on after I graduated um and then um maybe later i forget um but yeah then like i knew him yeah it was like a year year went on and like we we kept trying to work with work together but it never happened um and uh yeah then all of a sudden he told me about this feature film he was working on because basically they um uh they'd done that same group of people had basically done a, another feature the year before uh kickboxer okay um and then he ended up uh he started out as the um assistant editor but then ended up um finishing editing the movie mm-hmm. um and so they brought him on as editor for the next one which was uh yeah jujitsu jujitsu with nicholas crazy cage. <laughs> sci-fi action karate military <laughs> nicholas cage in, movie. indescribable film yeah yeah <laughs> uh, i think a lot of people describe it as like like predator meets mortal Kombat or something like that which i'd say it's pretty accurate um <laughs> i'm excited to check it out um uh yeah it's a ridiculous movie but it's it's a fun ride the action is actually pretty great um, I've, I've heard the in terms of the genre stuff i've heard the you know dialogue and characters and overall story are like not so great but in terms i mean of, it was, in terms it was not of the like, priority i would say <laughs> well yeah i've heard in terms of the visuals and the action that it's actually quite a bit of fun yeah yeah for sure no honestly like the the action set pieces are great like i really enjoyed watching those like the entire time i was coloring um 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 and so you were say? the you were the only color so on a feature film is there typically just one colorist work i know i know it's not on, like a huge I mean, blockbuster yeah, on, movie but on like a small i mean yeah on, on, on an indie film um yeah usually it'll just be like a colorist um and maybe like a color assist okay. um in this Did case you have i have an color- assistant or no i have an assist but it was i mean there was there um the workflow we did, I didn't really have to, like, this part was kind of, like, taken out of, like, the workflow. Um, and I guess, actually, that's not true, because there was, a, was a, obviously, there was a large amount of visual effects in the movie, which normally, like, the colorist or really the color system would deal with. But basically, the editors and assistant editors handled all of that. Um, so, um, yeah, it was, it was, like, a very small post team. It was um, uh, Dan, who was the... Uh, post producer and uh editor um then there was like uh a's some of the a's um switched in and out because they got busy uh there's like yeah three or four a's assistant editors yep. that is um and um then uh i think there's total maybe like five or six visual effects artists um in total total who worked do on the they movie. complete their work before you get yes to begin the visual effects I, are done ideally then, okay ideally, ideally yeah. in this case definitely because then how uh, does that the, work in terms of the colorist work when you are dealing with a lot of visual eff- i know it's not you know probably a, a, well i don't know how much in terms of the visual effects was there quite a bit Quite oh yeah it's, yeah very i forget how many shots but yeah it's a uh, so a then very how does that work do sure. you do you have to have kind of a cooperative um work process with them to kind of i guess i i'll let you kind of talk on that yeah so vfx always makes everything complicated basically that's where all that <laughs> the, 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 the really technical stuff i was talking about where you have to worry about like linear light or logarithmic light or Especially all that that's when it's exactly created from scratch on a computer right it's not something yeah that, that's shot exactly so that's exactly like when you have to worry about all that um so basically um yeah the ideal way you do it is is you kind of like you more or less um, do like a little bit of like preview color for the VFX. So, like you make like them what's called like a lookup table um, for them to put on their footage that kind of shows them what the color is going to be look like mm-hmm. more or less later. Um, in this case, we ended up doing that. We just used like a, a generic lookup table um, for the camera, um, which also worked fine. Um, but um and yeah and then at the start before everything we just kind of like ironed out the workflow to make sure that you know everything they're going to give me is going to be in the proper color space no, well actually i'm giving the editors because the editors um editors and this is an editors handed all of that um and then um ideally also you'll they'll render out mats so they'll render out like basically um uh these files that let me adjust just the it's like when i get the shot and the vfx is baked in the shot 
it'll let me adjust just the part of the v of the that's actual vfx in the shot so i can like you know if i need to adjust it to make it fit better in the frame okay. with all the color interesting that yeah. i can adjust just that part of the image that makes sense. um although um yeah because of budget limitations that didn't end up happening on this either um um but yeah generally it just becomes um yeah crazy just because of like, you have to import all the files and then oftentimes especially on bigger and bigger movies for sure you pretty much always start color while vfx is happening so mm -hmm. you have to import them into the project and then apply the color and then import the mats and then it's yeah just adds a bunch of work just yeah uh, you know importing everything and then you find a mistake gotta send it back um and you also oftentimes um you know usually ideally in in um in the what's called like digital intermediate which includes color grading um um and it's, yeah going to be handled by the colors and color system mm -hmm. everybody um that's where you know you also have to export all the files for vfx so you have to you know, export the files and import them then you find errors give it back um import them again and apply the <laughs> color so it just becomes like a huge mess and you have to keep track of all the different shots and everything oh, um luckily i didn't have handle on it on jujitsu okay. it was all the editors um they had a yeah a whole workflow set up in their software um, yeah, they actually did a a, a podcast thing with Adobe talking about that. If you oh, really? That up. Okay. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so on this one, it didn't affect my job too much. I kind of just got the VFX and just you know made it work how it was, um, which for the most part was fine. Um, I mean, <laughs> given the you know the VFX that we had, <laughs> um, um, and um, uh, yeah, wasn't what didn't end up being too big of a of a headache on my end um for that for jujitsu thankfully so going off of that i kind of want to ask you even more specific question that sure, you sure. talk about generally or maybe you can talk about specifically with jujitsu but with your job since you were getting um you know a film or a project you know whether it's jujitsu or a music video or a commercial or documentary you know something that you didn't create right some someone else wrote it shot it directed it produced it edited it and you're just coming in you're being hired to to make it look really nice you know the coloring and, and some of the work that you do with the lighting and the face textures and things like that so but mm -hmm. do you when you're doing your job um and you're hired to do these projects whether it's jujitsu or a clipping music video, um, <laughs> do you get lost in your work or do you find yourself often? I know you just mentioned that you were enjoying watching some of the shots in jujitsu. So whether it's a big or a small project, do you find yourself kind of analyzing, critiquing, criticizing the work that you're working on? Or do you just kind of block that out and kind of, eh, I got a job to do. I'm focused on this job. It, it really depends. Um, um, like there's some things where especially if i know exactly like what i want to do or mm -hmm. what 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 the person wants or especially especially if it's like something that i'm you know i need to get done very quickly um like if it's like a short film i need to get done very quickly and i know exactly what i need to do i won't even necessarily watch it with the sound on <laughs> um um but most of the time i try to do that certainly at least in the start um you know like really like taking the movie and everything so i can get the context in uh context of the film in mm -hmm. um because obviously you know the what i'm doing it's not just making it pretty but it's you know using color to advance the story so i need to understand the context yeah. of the story in order yep. to yeah for any, um, anyone listening that. if you don't if you if you don't or, or if you're if you're not aware of it color a lot of times especially if you know, if you're someone who takes it very seriously, like Elliot does, it has can have a lot of significance, you know, metaphors and themes. Yeah, and, most definitely. And a lot of overall meaning to a film, um, a lot of movies. Yeah, and it's just like, more than anything, it's just like kind of portraying the mood of the scene. So if yeah, you don't understand the absolutely. mood of the scene and what the characters are feeling, then then yeah, you can't really do a good job, um, barring, you know, the direction you've been giving. Absolutely. Um, but yeah. Um, uh but yeah so it kind of depends um you know there's some stuff where it's you know it's like if i'm coloring some you know corporate thing then i'm i'm not <laughs> i'm like, not analyzing it for you know it's deeper meaning or anything yeah. like that um uh and um yeah i don't i don't do that many um uh narrative projects anymore i i'm more so doing commercials as of late um but um um yeah, same thing with also with music videos. It's it really just depends on how good the song is. <laughs> well, I saw I saw you recently did a Bella Thorne music video. Oh, S did you S see SFB? 
<laughs> How did you see that? I did. I, I went. I went and watched. Uh, I went and watched. Um, I went and watched some of the music video, and the coloring's great. I mean, the colors, I, and because <laughs> it's like on the beach at night, and it's like lit by a fire. So there is some very there's some darks and some lights lit up by the color. Uh, yeah, from the I, I did. I did. I did two videos for. It. I did SFB, and I also did Shake It, which came out this week. Um, I did see. I did see that that just came out too. I I honestly had no idea who Bella Thorne was, and then I'm like, oh my god, she's kind of like a big star. Apparently, yeah, she's, she's pretty. She's pretty Disney. famous. Yeah. I didn't know who she was. I had to like. Yeah, she her. she was on Disney. Um, yeah, she had recent. She's um, yeah, acts in a bunch of movies. She's Clip, had clipping some controversies probably, as well. Yeah, I did see some of the controversies. <laughs> but I was just to say, clipping's probably a little bit far more interesting in terms of their <laughs> their music videos. I would yeah, imagine. that was only one. That was only one I did, did the for one. them. Yeah, um, yeah. I didn't actually know who they were before I did the video. Unfortunately, I I just got into but, them um, last year. I just got into them, and um, I really got in. And this is kind of completely off topic, but the reason I really got into them was because of Davi Diggs. Um, Davi Diggs, who was in Hamilton. Um, I, oh, yeah, I had yeah. never, well, I had never seen Hamilton until they put it on Disney plus last year. But my first experience with Davi Diggs was the film that he created with his buddy, uh, Raphael Nassau, I think is his name. They made the film blind spotting in 2018. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, that was my first, cause that was one of my favorite films of that year. It's, uh, Chapman grad too. Raphael is mm-hmm. no way. I didn't know. Yeah. That. I know. I know a bunch of people work for his production company. He is awesome. He's had an interesting trajectory too. He's kind of getting more and more popular, doing more and more projects. He was in that film with Hugh Jack. He was Hugh Jackman's lover in Bad Education this last year. Mm. <laughs> uh, the the HBO original film. So he's been getting more and more uh, projects. Anyway, got a little sidetrack there. Uh, I told <laughs> I told Elliot we'd pro- I'd probably get sidetracked at some point. Um, going going back to you though. Um, Kind of, kind of. I'll move on with one more question here. A couple, one or two more questions before we we talk about. We are going to talk about a movie tonight. So before we get out of the movie discussion, I got two more questions. I just want to ask you. The first one was, um, do you feel that people tend to forget that the majority of the film industry is made up of people like you, not you know the A list celebrity Hollywood stars? I mean, when people think of movies and hollywood and you know the film industry they think of these big name actors and actresses and directors and writers and producers they forget that that's like a very small percentage of the employees right they're just the high profile ones the majority yeah. I mean, you i always it always drives me nuts when people you know don't want to sit and watch the credits i get i get not saying wanting to sit and watch the credits but if you take the time to sit and watch the credits at the end of any project whether it be a big film or a small film there's hundreds of people that work on that project right the cast yeah yeah the writer director and producers whatever that's a very small number of the people so do you feel people tend to forget um or not acknowledge or they're just not aware of of the extent of jobs and people who are to degree to a degree for sure i mean like i said most people don't know my job exists like i tell people my colors and they're like oh you mean like you do hair (laughs) (laughs) hairstylist hair hair colorist (laughs) yeah no actually that Um, is funny (laughs) um so yeah and i remember uh, i was was talking to somebody the other day about how like sometimes i get frustrated when when um when people are like um like uh, you know that movie was so good because the acting was like so amazing and I'm like like there's a director there's a photographer there's like some people who like you know did so much like you know make you feel the things you did it wasn't just the people you're actually seeing on screen mm-hmm. um, so in that sense I do um, but I mean also yeah I mean I feel like to a degree at least like people know um, that you know there are whole crews and everything like you know people were there's always like a small obsession over like behind the scenes and stuff like that um certainly for like on set positions people people don't really know what's going on but you know mm-hmm. they know that there's you know crew you know there's an editor you know that they're doing things you might not realize like how much of an impact those things make um i don't think people appreciate how, but, how much goes into you know even a project like oftentimes no. is a small budget film but even a project like that like i don't think people understand how much goes into it no on yeah it, they kind of take it for granted when, they show up to a movie theater or turn on netflix and Oh, I'm just watching a movie and I like it. A time, that, the, a time that really becomes apparent is when you do a music video with an artist who's never done a music video for because okay. every time they think it's going to be like this simple process and they get into it and they're like, oh man, I didn't know this was going to be so much work. <laughs> um, and then realize that, yeah, just like how like they just think how much is necessary a, even to make this three minute video clip. Yeah, they think it's something so, yeah, with a camera like a and a movie. director probably. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. But no, there's like, you know, you need there's to a lot. Have, 
yeah if you don't have people like makeup, lighting and everything then production it's just design not really location good. scout you got you know all the people who do the little jobs like just you know catering and the insurance and and props yeah and, i mean there's so and, much stuff that i don't think people yeah ever transportation oh, yeah yeah stuff that yeah yeah that, yeah that kind of stuff that really people really don't even realize yeah those really yeah small for sure jobs that are on set and things like that mm -hmm. yeah i think i think in this day and age and i hope you know with the it's kind of a, a double-edged sword with the amount of information that people have access to um sometimes it's a bit of a, a too much to the point where people just don't care because it's there so they're lazy like <laughs> ah, if i wanted to look something up i could but at the same time i think there's a lot more people especially young people you know students that i work with that become more and more aware that um you know there's a lot of opportunities a lot of different things that you can do you don't have to just be an actor you don't have to just be a director because i feel like that was the stereotypical thing for decades you know i'm gonna go to hollywood and be an actor or a writer or a director definitely or a producer, definitely yeah and opposed to like saying i'm gonna be a colorist right i'm gonna be a technician i'm gonna be a, a you know i'm gonna work in sound i'm gonna i'm gonna work in you know i'm gonna work in scouting you know locations production design you know so i think that people are becoming more and more aware that that you know the film industry isn't so um it's it's not so narrow you know it there's a it's a vast and 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 wide array of different jobs but um Definitely, so i do want to yeah. ask you one more question here before we get into talking about the movie um two more questions one's very quick the other one is a question that elliot wanted me to add to the list and i thought it was appropriate to kind of you know these two questions i think are good to end with um Elliot is very passionate about how shots look, how things are filmed, uh, how the camera's used, obviously the coloring. Um, so, Elliot, would you like to discuss what makes a good shot, what makes a beautiful <laughs> shot, you know, a good, a good shot versus a bad shot? Um, obviously, you, you are very into cinematography, which we're going to talk about that a little bit with the film here in a moment because um, the film we're going to talk about has got a lot of Oscar buzz for cinematography. Um, but, yeah, do you want to kind of share your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's just something I think about from time to time, um, because like, you know, it's like this very like subjective thing, yet for some reason, like if you do some things, then a larger number of people will think that it's a good looking, you know, picture, you know, shot or whatever, um, painting even. Um, and then if you do other things, then it won't. Um, so like, even though it's subjective, there seems to be like some degree of like objectivity of like what makes something pretty and what makes something not. Um, and um yeah it's like interesting because like basically the, the the main thing to know in my job is what that is yep <laughs> um because literally i'm taking something that's already supposed to look good and then i have to make it look better in one way or yes. another um and um so like at a technical level like the main thing is just um like making sure that the subject is or whatever the focus of the frame is stands out from everything else Yep. Um, so like generally if you have something that has like, you know, a lot of things in it, um, but then what the main focus isn't clear, it'll look not great. So like if you imagine like um I don't know, like a, a beach full of people, yep, and then everybody looks the same, then that's it's just, just you're just well, like whatever. Like boring. It's like uninteresting. Yeah. But it's if you take you're supposed that to focus then, on, yeah. Yeah, but if you take that and then put right in the center of the frame, you know, something like weird, like a giant shark or something, then it becomes interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and so, yeah, so the different things you can do to, um, to yeah, just bring the subject out is the main thing, whether that's, you know, um, oftentimes it's like, you know, darkening things around the subject and brightening up the subject or um, playing around with color, it's like color contrast. So oftentimes like you'll make like, the um by making the the shadows uh cooler and the um brighter tones warmer or at least leaving them as is then because everything else around the subject is more in shadow then that helps you know separate them from the background and you know increase focus in them um and um so there's that but then the part um and there's other other things too where it's like if you do that then it becomes very obvious that that's what um what makes it look better such as um like if you have um uh that effect that you see when if you're looking at mountains from very far away yep um then the mountains look like you know very like foggy whereas like things very close have, a, have 
you know, much more like contrast per yes. se. Yep. So if you can kind of like create that effect in color um, or even, or in cinematography, it, for whatever reason, it, it makes us think that it's like a good looking image. But I, the, yeah, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, what I always find interesting though is the kind of also, there's also some weird, just like uh, less tangible aspect to it too, where mm -hmm. especially where if you just, um, just like little like, like details like um, that, that the more things that'll be more different for different people. So like me, one big thing is just like the texture of people's skin um, is one thing where it's like, if it's very smooth, it looks kind of ugly to me, but if I can kind of like see the detail in it, then it just looks like a better pe better looking image to me. Yeah. Which other people who say the exact opposite. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, one thing was found interesting is that in general, if it like if there is like a mismatch between what the image is looking like and what the actual story is supposed to be, then it even if it maybe kind of objectively looks good, then it feels kind of ugly just because of there's that weird like mismatch between what it's supposed to be and what it actually looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, which yeah, I've just always found super interesting. And so, and are you, are you kind of more talking about just a single frame too? You're not quite going in, uh, along the lines of maybe the use, how the camera is used. You're more talking oh, about yeah, like what's I mean, in camera. That, particularly, yeah. That's a whole nother thing. I mean, yeah, like that's yeah, there's, you're, you're um, just focusing on what's in camera in a given frame of a shot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. What's uh, how the how are they? Used, that's, that's how if there's thing. characters I mean, like the blocking, like how are they setting up the scene? If it's like a, a shot, you know, a wide shot outside, which the film we're going to talk about. Well, yeah, that's a lot of that. You know, using how are you using things in the foreground and the background? Well, yeah, that that's part of what I meant actually with like yep. the subject, because it's like Absolutely. if you have your subjects um, standing in certain ways, like if you just have your if you just you know, take your subjects and then put them out in just like a random position, then it's going to look bad. But if you um, put them in um, in like certain parts of the frame, set where your eye is directed to like the to the subject of the actual frame, um, or then that makes it look like a good looking image. It's like it's so if you if you don't actually like adjust like the what what's in your frame, it's that you know like you know no matter how you do it, whether it's like with the lighting, whether it's the blocking, whether it's with the color choices, yep. um, if you don't make the subject look um stand out then it just looks yeah. ugly to us for some reason which i always found super interesting no i i think that is an interesting topic too and i'm actually it's kind of interesting that you mentioned some of this because i think it's going to be very relevant to the movie we're talking about in just a second here because the, <laughs> the film we're about to talk about has kind of some shots um that kind of follow some of the things you were talking about in terms of describing mm -hmm. you know good and bad shots and how you're using especially wide shots outside you talked about mountains <laughs> we're gonna see that we're <laughs> yeah. gonna talk about in just a moment um so i will move on here because uh i don't want to keep you too late and i know we're actually we're pushing over an hour and a half i think at this point we've got a good conversation oh, wow. going here um <laughs> so the last question i want to ask you personally before we get to our movie that we're gonna talk about here is uh so what are your kind of goals for the future at this point? So you got, you got your thing going here um, as a freelance um, colorist and, you know, you've, you've kind of gotten a couple, you know, slowly bigger and bigger projects or at least more what you can consider more high profile projects um, uh, in the last couple of years here. Um, do you kind of have goals or aspirations in terms of moving forward and what you might want to do or, or, or maybe you have some things you're working on you can't talk about that are kind of hitting some of, the, <laughs> hitting some of those, those goals already? Um, I mean, yeah, nothing too concrete. Um, I'm kind of just sitting out the pandemic more or less. Yeah. Um, like my main goal right now is I really want to work with more international clients just because oh, wow. I feel like that'd be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Some and, Spanish, uh, Espanol. Yeah, I, uh, my Spanish is yeah better than it ever was. I've also, um, my French is like not too bad anymore either. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, working with like Mexico or Spain, um, where I both have some connections, um, yeah, it would be fun. And like, that's the other cool thing about the pandemic is like everything is remote. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's, it's hoping to do that. Then there's no better time ever to do that. Um, and then yeah, apart from that, like, yeah, I don't have too much that um, really planned out for the future just because it's very hard to do anything in, in during a pandemic. Like I would love to do like, um, 
some sort of like side project in the future um or you're like you know shooting music video or something like that but um yeah given just how hard everything is with yeah. the fact that you know if you do shoot something you have to have all these like covid regulations and everything um then uh yeah it's a bit tricky um yeah so um yeah mostly it's just um yeah keep freelancing work with like more international clients um then um i've got a, a color house or two i might try to work with um and um and then yeah then just kind of take totally. things from there once uh once covid dies down a bit <laughs> well great man that's that's i appreciate you sharing a lot of that and uh sounds like you do have a lot of great things going on right now and can hopefully continue to uh to only uh stay that way and and uh, branch out into some of the other things that you're interested in but uh <laughs> thank you we'll, yeah we'll uh we'll switch gears here uh to a movie that we're going to talk about uh we'll wind it down from there but um elliot is very busy so he he doesn't even though he loves movies he doesn't get to watch <laughs> as many as as he wants to i always bug him when I, well, it's... him and i will swap texts every once in a while i always bug him about movies it's Sorry, not even saying. just that. It's that, like you know, I spend all day looking at a at, at my yeah. TV. Yeah, that's true. You're just like <laughs> trying so, to get away know, from a screen. The last thing I want to do is like spend another two hours sometimes. Yeah. So. Okay, that makes sense. But too. Uh, but yeah, it's a shame though because whenever I watch it, I'm like, oh man, I love it so much. <laughs> 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 so the movie that um elliot was able to watch to, actually we literally him and i both just finished it <laughs> we were actually running late to start the podcast because him and i both started the film a little bit later than we had attended but um a movie that's gotten a lot of buzz um i have not checked the golden globes i think are over now uh they were going on tonight i have not had a chance to check and see but this film was up for some golden globes it's likely that when the oscars announce their nominations this film will be nominated for a lot of oscars um and the film that we just watched and we're going to talk about is nomadland um which technically was supposed to come out in 2020 it was released in several fe festivals um it was the first film ever um to win um the top prize at the Venice Film Festival and the top prize at Toronto International Film Festival. First yeah. film ever to do that. Um, so, and it did have a limited release uh, where theaters were open back in December. Um, if you live, I live in Lansing. If you're listening, you're from the mid Michigan Lansing area. It is currently at NCG in celebration. It is at some local cinemas. And I actually, uh, my wife and I were deciding between this film and Minari. Uh, last week and we ended up seeing Minari, which is also a great film that's getting a lot of buzz too. Um, but if you have Hulu, and Elliot and I both have Hulu, uh, Nomadland is currently streaming as a, a Hulu original film. They bought the, the streaming rights for it, so you can watch it on Hulu if you're not able to get to a, a movie theater. But the film Nomadland is a drama and is based on a book that's also called No Man Land with the, the secondary title of Surviving America in the 21st Century. The book came out in 2017. Um and it is a drama written, directed, and edited by Chloe Zhao. We were just talking about, Elliot and I were just talking about people doing multiple, pro doing, trying to do many different things on one film. So I'm always impressed when I see directors who, you know, not only write and direct, but maybe produce and edit. Some, it's very rare, but once in a while you'll see them edit their own films too. Um, and it follows a woman played by Frances McDormand. Uh, her name is Fern, um, who is a nomad. Uh, it actually talks about a real life topic um that i was not aware of i don't know if you were aware of the blurb at the beginning of the movie and they show it at the end of the film um they talk about a, a a town a village um in nevada called empire um that in 2011 it had the one of the oldest operating mining companies in the country um at the time it was like almost 90 years old and it shut down uh post 2008 you know um, the recession, they, they had to close that location. They still have other locations across the country, um, but they had to close that location. The town was a mining town, so the entire town of Empire, Nevada, was employed and completely run and operated because of this mine. Um, the next closest town was 60 miles away. Um, so when it shut down, the town is officially listed as a ghost town now um, because uh, they... Uh, everyone had to leave. They, the 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 my, the only the single reason for employment was gone. Uh, so they said the population at one point was 750. I looked back in 2000 or in the 1960s. I think they said in 2011 when it closed there was a few hundred. Uh, it was like three or four hundred people. But 
Um, the character in this film, she is supposed to have been working with her husband. They lived in this town empire and working with her husband there when it closed down. Um, when the film starts, this isn't, we're going to talk spoilers, but, uh, this isn't tech. So if you haven't seen Nomadland, we are going to talk details about it. But, uh, at the beginning of the film, her husband has passed away and, um, uh, she is she is recently unemployed as the, the the it takes place in 2011 right after it shut down and she basically got, gets rid of all of her stuff she puts some of it in storage in town there and she becomes a nomad she she, she gets rid of a bunch of things and buys a van uh, outfits it to live in it and uh, they show her basically the entire film is pretty much her uh, taking seasonal jobs living in her van around the country and um, kind of follows her through that journey over the course of I think it's two years because they show her celebrate New Year's twice so it's like a close to two years that the film kind of traverses over the hour 45 minutes so so Elliot sorry I was kind of a long-winded uh no intro to the film uh what'd you think of the movie uh yeah I thought it was great um yeah I'm I'm always about you know very kind of like um you know life portrait kind of movies slice of life kind of movies um and this one was definitely that to a degree where it just you know you follow this you're following a character but by following that character you get to know like this other community um place of people um that you know you would have never experienced otherwise um and, and, it did it and, very ex- well. and exploring the human condition in ways that maybe you don't Exactly. You know, people like you and me or maybe take for granted, you know, things in our lives like just having a house, um, you know, and having, you know, somewhere to sleep and, mm-hmm. you know, a bedroom, you know, kind of the human condition that you don't think about from our perspective on a day to day basis. People who, you know, have lost everything. And, and, you know, some they show in the movie that some of these people have chosen to live this lifestyle, but some of them don't have a choice. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they show there's a couple characters they show in the film who literally are living like you know they're homeless they don't have anything i mean the nomads in the films are not necessarily they and they distinguish that they make a point more than once um francis mcdormand's character fern um is asked by a young girl early in the film uh, i think it's a friend of hers her daughter asks are you homeless my mom says you're homeless and it's like a whole scene she goes just because i don't have a house doesn't mean i'm not homeless right so i think that's mm-hmm. an interesting distinction and point you know that they don't, she doesn't think of, she has a, a van that she's turned into her home and she considers, you know, wherever she is her home, which I think is an interesting, um, it's, a, it's an interesting topic to explore. And, and I, I agree with what you said. I do like these kind of films where, you know, most, the average audience member may not find, they may call this movie boring. You know, there's not yeah, a whole yeah. lot that happens, but if you, um, I think what makes this film interesting, at least for me, um, is again the explorations of the human condition. Um, it it does kind of cover a lot of different ideas and themes um, about life in general, and like um, you know what is a home. You know what's our you know what what how do we find our way in this world? Especially the movie kind of talks about grief and tragedy and loss a bit too, um, mm-hmm. as she is exploring and, and trying to live with her husband you know, who died of cancer before the film even started, died of, I think they said of cancer. Um, yeah. And so she's trying to, you know, make her way in life now that she's lost her job, she's lost her husband. She doesn't really have much left. Um, and, and, you know, trying to figure out where to go from there. And I mentioned earlier, uh, great cinematography. Uh, the cinematographer no, sure. is, uh, this has been a, a popular pre Oscars choice for best cinematography, Joshua James Richards, who doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. So if I, I'd have to go check his IMDB to see, um, you know, some of his previous works, Chloe Zhao, who is the director, writer, uh, and editor. She edited the film as well, has not done a lot. She did a film. This is, I think only her fourth feature. Um, third, this was her third feature. Her Phil's first film. I've never heard of songs. My brother taught me, drama film in 2015 her last film i've heard of it got a lot of buzz a lot of acclaim but i've not taken the time to see it It was called the rider in 2017 a western drama that was supposed to be really good um she is set this year to do a marvel film (laughs) so she did this film last year and now eternals a new marvel film 
uh, is supposed to come out later this year. She is writing and directing it. Um, apparently, she was working on Nomad Land and Eternals at the same time. Wow. So very interesting. Yeah. Um, another interesting thing about this film, um, the three or four of the nomads in the film are real nomads. Their real names are used in the film. They are portraying themselves in the film, and they are in the book. Um, interesting production note that I read. So that the woman Swanky, um, Bob Wells, the guy who leads the com- commune in Arizona, I think his name was Bob Wells, and then Linda, I think was the other one. Those three are the, those are real people. Like that's their names. Wow. They're nomads. Uh, they were subjects of the book. And they got them to be in the movie too. Um, so interesting, really? yeah, interesting f- trivia fact there. I read that I was, fr- I was, I was watching that scene at the end where where she's talking to Bob, and I was like, oh wow, man, that guy's acting so great. <laughs> I think it's real. I'm I'm pretty sure because wow. it said that yeah, he's a real nomad. That's like him. Wow. That's what he does. So the book, wow. I guess, kind of um, focused on some real life subjects, and then they got them to join in and be in the movie. So wow. I'm wondering if I was going to look later on, see if I could find more information, if th- that scene is very powerful at the end. And then when you find out that he's not an actor, he's a real nomad. Yeah. I wonder if that was just his gen- a genuine monologue about his life. I mean, yeah, so that's the game. I mean, yeah, he, he very much might have just been telling his real life story. So that's, you know, that's what makes it feel so real is because it is. And it's, it's yeah. a very, uh, that final, one of the final scenes of the movie, yeah, when Bob Wells is, is you know, telling uh fern fern is talking about you know trying to deal deal with the grief of her husband's passing and he you know reveals to her that his son committed suicide um Mm -hmm. at five years i think he says five years ago because she's at the in the scene he goes he would be 33 today it was five years ago um and he breaks down and he he goes i he goes it's hard for me to even say that and he, you know, he breaks up as he's trying to explain it. And yeah, it's a very, one of the most powerful moments in, in the whole movie. Um, cause it, it's that moment that kind of brings an arc for the character. I wouldn't say Frances McDormand's character has a true arc in the film. She kind of more comes to like, it seems like self acceptance by the end of the movie. Um, kind of. And maybe like a bit of a realization. Like it's not even like some huge revelation. It just seems like, maybe that conversation and some of the events of the film and then the final moment of the movie where she goes back to empire um to go see her house she she sells all the stuff in her storage unit um and kind of explores the town their old the mining factory and she kind of you know she like she she has some very emotional moments by herself quietly in these areas and you know with that coupled with the conversation with bob in the previous scene um which they, they you assume is relatively you know those moments are not too far apart in time. The movie kind of does jump around a bit in time um, in terms of there's gaps that you just assume time has passed. Um, but I would imagine those final two scenes are pretty close. Um, that it doesn't seem like a huge revelation to her, but maybe her character has kind of got some self acceptance at this point, like you know, because throughout the film she's questioning. She has people in her life questioning this lifestyle. She's questioning what she should do. And it seems at the end she's just kind of accepted, you know, she walks away and you just assume she continues her life on the road. And she's kind of just maybe had some closure at that point after talking with Bob. And maybe not had closure because Bob, even in the conversation, it is kind of an interesting topic on grief in general, you know, that it's okay to be sad. You know, sometimes you just might not get over it. He says, I still don't feel like I've gotten over it and that's okay. You know, he keeps saying, mm-hmm. it's okay. You don't have to get over, you know, tragedy and grief in your life. You just kind of, a lot of people just learn to live with it. And so I'm, mm-hmm. you know, so in that regard, you know, someone might consider this film boring because a lot doesn't really happen. But I personally, I kind of find those kind of explorations um, of the human, you know, human emotion and the human condition and um, our purpose in life, you know, those you can get bigger and bigger with some of those themes. I always think it's very interesting. And I think the way that this story is presented uh, the cinematography, especially. Oh man, there's some gorgeous wide shots of Arizona, South Dakota. Yeah. Um, um, they're in California at one point, Nevada. I mean, there's some beautiful shots of the West, Southwest, and Middle America. Yeah, for sure. Breath- breathtaking with the mountains and 
there's a few you talk about lighting uh there's a few great uses of of firelight and uh sun you know natural lighting um there's even some great shots in her camper at night Mm -hmm. um that even it kind of bleeds the darkness into like the moonlight and like the early morning light outside kind of bleeds together there's some really cool shots there and some of the the coloring i was so you, with with your job what did you think of the the coloring of the movie do you do you find I mean, yourself when you watch it's... films looking at that quite a bit oh uh, yeah all the time i can't stop um, <laughs> <laughs> um uh yeah i'm always like you know trying to like, find like the mistakes and everything it's really annoying but um but yeah no, it's very hard to do like um the hardest things to do oftentimes are very natural looks like that like something that looks good but also feels very natural um and that it's super well there i was in general like impressed like yeah with the coloring the cinematography how they're able to like have you know these like you know great um wide shots or not even the wide shots even like when it's closer up but then yeah um, when she's you... like when she, her it's like uh almost like a pov like right on her face and they have you know the environment in the background she's the focus of the shot excuse me yeah shot. yeah exactly but, but how they still like you know you can still see those mountains and like you know yeah. the horizon everything in the background and it's Absolutely. not like too bright or anything but there's still like a lot of con- contrast in the foreground that's actually very hard to do um and um yeah it was like no matter what no matter like where um throughout throughout the whole entire movie like you the the background always just looked like amazing um and as well as its subject um so yeah they really just like placed her in her um and then all you know all the characters in their environment like incredibly well and i think it it was a significant visual storytelling choice especially with the con you know the context of like the narrative of the film um because you have these characters who are all you know from the of an outside perspective you could label them like lost in life but i they Mm -hmm a lot of them accept this lifestyle of living out in the wilderness and, and being nomadic and just living off the land and living freely wherever they want. And so like, you know, Chloe Zhao has these grand wide shots, um, you know, where sometimes it's just her van, right? Sometimes it's just her. Sometimes it's, you know, this group of people and you, you just, you take in this huge environment. It kind of, it kind of makes you think, man, how small and insignificant we are. So then when they get to these, you know, these moments of the human condition and talking about, you know, people's problems and things it it does kind of come back into play in that final conversation where, you know, it's like, it's okay. You know, there's crappy things that happen and, and, you know, you can deal with it however you want, but at the end of the day, you know, you got to kind of live your life. However you, you, you choose to do it, whatever, however it is best for you. Um, so I think, you know, um, I think that's very intentional and obviously, you know, with the source material, it's, it's going to be a natural, um, you know, script, you know, book to screen, you know, cause I'm sure I haven't read the book, but I'm assuming the, it's probably pretty faithful. I would imagine, especially with them using three of the real life characters, subjects from mm-hmm. the book in the film. So I'd imagine it's pretty faithful. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, that's one thing I wanted to mention that it was like, it's very like, I'm, I'm in general, like, yeah, like I said, I like really like slice of, slice of life movies that kind of like harken back to, you know, the, um, the uh, you know, the idea of like, um, you know, from the Italian filmmakers in the oh yeah the 50s and 60s of Italian neorealism, where um, there's this uh, Zavatini quote, quote that's like something like, um, how my goal is to make a movie that's 90 minutes about nothing. Um, <laughs> um that i've always loved um but it's kind of like if you look if you, you know watch those movies like you know you watch um like bicycle thieves for example is like the quintessential italian i know that's that's one of my watch movie. list i know i need to watch oh that. yeah you gotta see that it's on my watch but list. um but yeah well without without spoiling it um like um uh the way the movie starts is more or less the way that it ends um yeah and uh that's, that was so, kind of this film too nomad land i mean at the exactly end, that's what i mean and also like uh, same thing with the italian neuralist movies like they're they're big on like using like people a, from those extra situations as the actors they weren't like actors or just people they found on the street who are like yep. living that life um so yeah it's interesting that that they very much had like a kind of similar philosophy here more or less it seems oh yeah um yeah yeah i i i do like those kind of movies too and i'm i'm trying 
uh, I'm trying off the top of my head to think of some more films like this that um, I've enjoyed. Um, oh you, man, you, you know, don't don't really tell you some grand narrative. The focus isn't really some crazy story. It's just about life, right? It's just about. The, but there, there is uh, two movies. I was, actually, no, there's a lot of movies. I'm thinking about the entire time I was watching. One of them, oh, I can't remember the name. It's about, uh, I think then, I forget the name. It's about this, this. Uh, it's it's similar plot in that it's um, it's about uh, a much younger woman named I think Wendy. I think it's in the title as well. Um, hmm. and her dog is also like living out of her car. Um, yeah, it's a pretty similar. The other one was um, uh, have you seen Ballast? No, I have not. It's also it's also like a very like indie um not not very seen movie at all okay um that that was like the director's only movie but um yeah it's about um it's very similar um similar vibes and that it's like it's about uh this like family um oh it's specifically about it's the main character is this is this one man whose twin brother just killed himself um and about his relationship with his um his brother's wife um, and her child, um, and it's set in like in the middle of the, the Mississippi River Delta. Um, Sounds interesting. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, and it's it's like this amazing, beautiful movie, but it's similar in that it's it's like you know about this people living in like this hard situation, but it's got all these like beautiful wide shot shots mm-hmm. from like places, your environment, and then but then not too much happens throughout the movie. It's really just about like they're just kind of like. Um, that not even just their specific everyday situation but like just how what life is in just like life, that part of, yeah. the, of the world i know um, and that like human condition like as you're mentioning i feel like if i if i sat down and really looked i could find some more films like this especially recent ones that i've seen and enjoyed but off the top of my head some escape me the only one that comes to my mind but a lot more happens in the film uh is american honey uh, with Shia, uh, La- Shia LaBeouf is in it, and a lot of known, like unknown actors were in it. Um, but there's there's a lot more that happens in that film in terms of mm-hmm. you know scene- scenes, like because this film doesn't really have scenes; it has like moments. Right? Yeah, it's exactly. a very contemplative. I don't know if I'd call it a brooding film, but it's a very thoughtful, contemplative. For sure, you're just kind of spending time with her. And you know, there's not really. I mean, yeah, it was all about the the details. Like the scene that, like, honestly, most got to me was just when when um, what's his name, Dave, um, mm-hmm. when she was unpacking her van because she had ants, and then Dave comes in to help her, and then he breaks the plates, and that just I like broke my right. heart. And that was just like because, because like they, because you feel bad for they, both of them. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, but I like I felt so bad just because they dropped like these plates, you know. But then they realize. The reason I feel so bad is because you know they had this like this moment where they're focusing just on the detail of these plates and it's like oh yeah you know these plates were um, were part of a collection that you know my my husband who died had been building and I only have these parts but they're very special to me um, and then you see them break later but it's just like focusing on like those deep those little details in the movie are really what makes it it's not about like the entire thing yeah thing. and then her you know by candle light or you know at night fixing it she's glues it back together exactly and, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it, it is it's just moments like that it's, it's human interactions and human experiences it's not like there's no like you know there's not like any crazy nothing like really bad or extreme happens to her there's no like character deaths or like serious hard-hitting drama it's just it's very grounded and realistic in that sense mm-hmm. that it's not like nothing crazy happens. It's like, this is, you know, people live like this and this is kind of no, like, yeah. uh, just a couple it, of years in their life, basically. You, you know how I could tell that was going to happen also? Cause like I went into this movie knowing absolutely nothing about it as I like to. Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> um, was, um, was cause like most movies, like there's that moment where, um, where, um, she was in the, the trailer park and then she found somebody's dog and then she like was trying to like find the owner and, um, of the dog and found out the owner had just been like, you know, um, had some medical thing and then had been, you know, whisked away by his family to the East Coast, yeah. um, then left his dog there. And then you know, she walks out and then the dog is like tied to the post and, um, and she told the person that she wasn't going to take it. And then she starts to walk away and then she turns back, looks at the dog. Um, you think she's going to take it and then she just walks away. 
because uh, you know most movies she would have gotten the dog and then you know would have changed her life and she would have become this happy person oh, yeah. but it's just not that kind of movie she just no. walks away and then that moment with the dog is never referenced again the rest of the film we, and uh, that's just and that's just why a I, moment and and yeah i like moments like that in the movie because that's just so realistic to me like like you said, exactly never, yeah. never mentioned again because it's like a moment like that is fleeting right and exactly in life, exactly in, yeah in real life it's fleeting it happens it's gone and yeah and, and then you know it doesn't it's not something that's relevant to you again but Mm -hmm. um but yeah yeah. but they show it in the movie because it's like it is a part of life yeah it's and it's like those and like you said that that's an interesting moment to bring up because the shot does linger right and the block yeah yeah. the blocking in that scene is very important how they show her they show her come out the door she looks at the dog the shot remains as she goes off screen Mm -hmm. comes back on screen i think she pats the dog on the head and then she just takes off i forget i think she goes up to the dog pats on the head she stops turns around looks and then she just takes off yeah, and the and shot kind of lingers yeah. for a moment. It doesn't cut right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of shots like that in the movie. Yeah, it's another thing. Another thing. That's another uh, very near realist movie for sure, where they just like let it linger longer than you you otherwise should. Because you, it's it's one of those films. It's yeah, like those kind of movies. You're spending. It's like you're. It's supposed to be you spending time, you know, with this character. Um, yeah, because it's it's not just about the character. It's about like their environment, and then yeah. not not them as a character but like them as a character who they're representing like that entire like group of people per se it's it's like they want you to come along for the experience exactly exactly yeah and i do always have trouble with these kind of movies investing in the character but i think Frances mcdormand is such a great actress that -hmm. she does bring some nuance and subtlety to the role and she does enough with the character where that I, it's a very simple character, you know, that she doesn't have her characterization is nothing. It's very simple, but she's a simple person. And honestly, that's most of America, right? Middle America. That's most of middle America, just very simple blue collar workers. And they live and they, they live, they work and they die. And they're, that's just the kind of their experience. And I, Again, some people, you know, going into this movie and coming out of this movie, like, oh, that was boring, that was stupid, and you know, they want yeah. something more entertaining. But I personally, I know you do too, personally enjoy these kind of films that make you make you think of perspectives and experiences outside of your own. On top of, in general, kind of exploring that that idea of what is living and like. Um, Definitely. And I, I know it does kind of sound like I'm getting these extreme big themes, but that is what the. <laughs> but I'm telling you that you know, and you, I know you agree. Oh yeah, no, it's it's like about how the exploring. little things relate to life as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's definitely yeah. why I think the film has been uh, so widely praised because it it and I think it ironically because it was not intentional, but it came out in a year, you know, in 2020 where. Um, <laughs> I think people have had to sit and really look in a mirror at themselves and question their lives and think about life more than they ever have in modern history. And so this is for sure. Yeah. It's, you know, even though it takes place in 2011 um, is very poignant and uh, you know, a great conversation piece for thinking about life in general and, and what does it mean to live and what does it mean to, you know, find your way, you know, in the world, no matter, you know, what choices you make and you know however you want to do it because she by the end of the movie like i said she's like kind of just accepted like this is my life and this is how i'm i'm gonna live my life and no one's gonna tell me how to live my life i'm gonna do it my way so Mm -hmm. i think i think that's uh that's something that anyone from any background could you know empathize with and i think mcdormand does a really great job of you know not going overboard with the role but you know doing enough with the character that you do feel for at the end and there's some really um, important moments and, and moments where you uh, you you can invest in her character because she's really it. I mean, she like we said, she has these fleeting moments with some other nomads and family members and and people in her life, but none of them last long. At least in the film, no, yeah. I think that Bob I mean, Wells and that Dave character are the only two that uh, show back up again, and maybe that Linda who she works with at yeah, Amazon. Le- yeah, I Linda for sure. Linda. I think it was those three yeah. characters. And um uh Squanny a bit too. Yeah. Um outside of that, everyone else just kind of comes in and out. It's just random strangers and people yeah. people she interacts with as she's just doing her thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> even her family, you know, kind of mentions, you know, she interacts with her sister, uh 
she's there's a scene where she's trying to get money or vans broken down and she goes to interact with her sister and she stays with her for a night in california and um, her sister even says that i wish i could have grown up with my sister all these years mm. so she's like you know resentful that she moved to the middle of nowhere nevada and and doesn't see her family so even her family interactions are like fleeting and you know don't don't last long but yeah but then at the same time she just doesn't want to stay put for whatever reason even at the end she's a nomad yeah (laughs) she she just wants to you know explore the country and and live on her own terms which i can respect Mm -hmm. but i also couldn't live in a van when it's (laughs) negative whatever degrees it was in the parking lot in nevada yeah i I don't know why you wouldn't go to the church that didn't make any sense yeah i was like (laughs) she's just too proud i guess too prideful yeah i guess yeah (laughs) um but anyway, I enjoyed the film. Um, I I'm still working on my 2020 list. I uh, <laughs> I'm gonna this the Oscars uh, qualifying run is through today. It was through the end of February. So this film, mm-hmm. um, even though its release in 2020 was festivals only and limited in December, I am gonna still keep it on my 2020 list. Um, so it'll probably be it'll probably be just outside my top ten. I don't think it'll quite make my top ten, but I did really enjoy mm-hmm. it. It's it's a film though like as much as I enjoyed it and I would recommend it to certain people I don't know how high the rewatch value is on it like I don't mm. know how quickly I would want to go yeah. visit it so yeah no I, I feel you on that for sure but um, anything else you want to add on the movie otherwise uh... uh no not really I think I said everything yeah I wanted to mention about it for sure <laughs> well all right man elliot uh thanks for joining me and uh before we take off here is there anything you want to plug oh uh sure i mean yeah if anybody um needs a colorist uh my website is www.colorbyelliot.com two l's two t's and elliot um my uh work instagram is also just at color by elliot um i also have a personal more street photography instagram if anybody I, might follow, be interested. I follow both of me a lot of great, <laughs> lot of great content and i will I'll, I'll put those links in the uh description on on the youtube video and i'll make sure uh um that i try to put them on the podcast store description too so yeah check out check out color by elliot.com b-y-e all one word with elliot and then again i'll have that link uh for for all of those things but um Thanks again for coming on, man. I hope we get to chat again soon on here. Of course, um, no problem. Reminder that all episodes of the Film Nerd Podcast can be found on YouTube. So if you can't find any of the old episodes on Spotify, Apple, or Amazon, that you can find older episodes on YouTube at the Film Vince the Film Nerd. Uh, we'll be back with another guest very soon. Until next time, Elliot, thanks for joining me. I'm Vince. Of course, no problem. <laughs> on the Film Nerd Podcast, and uh, go watch some movies.